Okay, let's get to it. So, chapter 1 and chapter 2 of our text focuses in on putting cost management in the context of strategy. Because you, you, you need to make sure that as you're thinking about the cost management issues you want to focus on, you're thinking about them in the, in the context of what's the strategy of the company. And so in, in this chapter, or in this next half hour to 45 minutes, we'll talk about some very basic strategy issues. And one thing I'd like to do in this class, uh, you can't, forget it. I was going to say, because some of the things you're going to hear, you've heard in other classes, and, and unfortunately that's going to be the case, I think. However, there are some people in the room who have not heard them, so I, I think we need to maybe repeat some basics that you may have heard along the way. I can't assume that you all have it. Okay, so our objectives. We'll put cost management in the organization. We'll talk about cost management as they relate to some contemporary business issues. Now, when we talk about contemporary business issues, I think if I would have um, given this presentation 20 years ago, they'd probably be the same issues. They change over time in the way you address them, but the issues are not just magically starting now. Um, We'll talk about different competitive strategies, and there are really two at the highest level. And then we'll briefly talk about ethical considerations. Management accounting is a space where you really need to think about ethical considerations. Okay. So management accounting, the definition, if you would, of management accounting is um, bringing accountants helping management in their decision-making process. And you have, to, you have to help to devise systems for planning and performance um, monitoring and management. And, and it's very closely related to financial reporting and control. Some of the things you do in management accounting lead into financial reporting and control. One of the things I'm going to do less than others might do in this class, I'm going to focus less on journal, journal entries, you know, how do you journalize management accounting variances and things like that. We'll mention it, but it's just not going to be our focus. In here. Others might teach the course differently and focus on it more. So ultimately, management accounting is a way to make sure that whatever strategy senior management is putting together is being implement, implemented. Where management accounting and financial accounting differ is financial accounting is really only looking at financial information. Management accounting looks at financial information plus other information. Um, and, and the combination of that allows you to help in, in determining whether strategies are being implemented. You're helping management determine whether the organization is, is um, delivering on the firm's key success factors or critical success factors. Is the firm delivering those critical success factors? If not, what do you need to do to make them deliver? Putting management accounting inside the organization I know we showed a similar chart before. There's a CFO. CFO has, I say, two functions reporting to it, a controller and a treasurer. I think textbooks still show the CIO reporting to the CFO. I think in a forward-thinking organization, that's not the case. That, this is the way it was back in the day because primarily technology was a way of delivering accounting information. But in today's world, technology should be viewed as an offensive weapon and really needs to have a line equal to some of the other lines. So I believe that's changed, but most books still show it going into the CFO. Cost accounting, cost management falls under the controller alongside of financial reporting and other things. 
Yes, sir. The treasurer is thinking about um, real monetary issues. So the treasurer is thinking about things. Do you know where? If we're going to make this investment to implement a strategy, where are we going to get the capital to do that? Um, you know, how are we going to keep our short-term cash um, flow going? We have excess cash. Where should we invest it? So the treasurer is thinking about those kinds of issues. The controller is thinking about more reporting issues. So I think that we've, we've more or less talked about this. Um, so cost management um, provides information um, for decision making. They assist in directing and controlling activities. An example of these two might be um, helping the organization make decisions like should we, should we build or should we buy. Um, it helps to motivate managers and employees towards the organization's goals. We'll talk about this later on in the semester, how you align management actions with the, goal, the strategic goals. And the best way to align a person with the strategic goals is through compensation plans that align with strategic goals. So we'll talk about that. Measures performance uh, by, by subunit, by program, by project, by manager, by employee. So you can measure performance. And we'll, we'll study variance analyses and things of that nature. And you can assess the organization's competitive advantage using things like benchmarking versus the industry leaders. I don't know if you've seen this flow. Um, markers? Thank you. Oh, before the end, uh, <laughs> yeah, throw it down. Oh. So uh, a flow of information, you know, you get raw data, your goal is to turn that raw data into information, and you turn it into knowledge, and then if, you can, if you're able to, turn that knowledge into wisdom, and then that wisdom becomes power, right? And there are many examples of that. So certainly, the goal of cost management is to at least get you to that point. And we'll talk about some examples where you can even get it to wisdom. So the difference between cost accounting and financial accounting Financial accounting is for external users to let them know how the firm is doing. It emphasizes accuracy and compliance with rules that are, are set out. Cost accounting is for internal users. It focuses on efficiency and effectiveness and emphasizes timeliness and usefulness of information. Different focuses 
difference between financial and cost. And when you think they both report to the controller, so the controller is dealing with competing goals and has to make sure that he, he or she can do that correctly. I, all over the place, I'm going to use them interchangeably. Cost, you'll hear me say cost accounting, management accounting. I'm going to use them interchangeably. It's, bo it's both. It's both, yeah. It's, to me, it's the same thing. Someone else might say different. Like, you can, I'm going to use them interchangeably without even thinking. And, probably mess you up. So if we think about managerial or cost accounting versus financial accounting, the users are managers within the organization versus outside people. Management accounting is not regulated because it's just for internal use. Um, and of course, GAAP and other Regulators are very careful to look at financial accounting. Management accounting uses the financial information, but also takes other information from benchmarks and things of that nature, where financial accounting really only uses um, financial information. We tend to focus on subunits in management accounting. Um, bringing together information, historical data estimates, and projections, and man financial accounting wants to focus on the enterprise as a whole, to tell the external markets how the enterprise is doing. So we're focusing at a finer level here to understand you know, how well subunits are, are performing. Okay, for so managing costs assists senior management in performing these four functions, which are their major functions. It assists them in strategic management as they're thinking about what should our mix of projects, of mix of products be. Um, what methods should we be using to, to, to deliver those products? What marketing strategy should we be using? Management accounting helps in the strategic aspects. Helps in planning and decision making. Things like make or buy decisions. Um, managing capacity. Scale, scheduling production across your mix of products. helps in management, day-to-day -day management, and operational control. Which of your factories are working inefficiently? Which ones are doing well? Which ones aren't doing well? If they're not doing well, um, what do we need to do to make that happen? And it helps in the preparation of financial statements. Um, the way you account for inventory. When, when, does it, when do things become expenses? How do you accumulate expenses? Um, into various categories. Um, so it helps in the preparation of financial statements. And I think these next two pages kind of just support what I just said. We'll talk more about critical success factors um, soon enough. You know, I'm going to just pass through these two. We've talked about them. So, the development of cost management systems over time ha has, have migrated from relatively simple systems to far more 
complicated and important systems. Um, the first stage of developing a cost management system was really just um, reporting on basic transactions. Second was to start to have decisions, decision useful information. And then you get more and more decision making capability until where we are today is strategically useful and is integrally um, part of the management process. Okay, so let's talk about you know five or six drivers that are driving the business world today. Um, and these are the ones that probably were driving 20 years ago as well. And they also drive the way that you do management accounting today. So the first is global. You hear that in every class. And everyone's been going global for quite some time. Um, 15 years ago, um, General Electric was 15% non-US. Now they're 50% non-US. Um, Walmart 15 years ago was 0% non-US. Now they're 25% non-US. Um, McDonald's has always been global, not always, but it's been global for quite some time. 15 years ago they were 47% non-US. Now they're 65% non-US. And quite often the growth is outside the US and the US, you know, the US operations provide the cash to fund the global growth. So there's no question that operating in a global business environment, while it's been going on for quite some time, is more and more prevalent. And the way that you respond to the global environment has changed. We'll talk about transfer pricing and tax considerations. What do we know about General Electric as related to taxes? They, they pay no U.S. taxes. One of our companies, out of the nine that you have here, I think pays 1% U.S. taxes. Um, lean manufacturing. You've heard the term just-in-time manufacturing in other classes? Okay. That's really what lean manufacturing talks about. And that's just more and more prevalent as really is the technology is allowed to become more and more prevalent. And the systems that you're working with, with your vendors, with your customers, allow really to, to, to trim inventory, to get your product to market faster. So lean manufacturing continues to be a driver. Um, one, because it makes customers happier when you get your product to them faster, and two, because you save money by not wasting time and, and, and money through the wait process as you're trying to deliver a product. IT. There's no question that every company has a presence on the internet now in some form. So IT has moved from a reporting function to a strategic function. And IT also on the factory floor. Um, we'll talk about something called activity-based costing. It's, it's, it's an idea that through technology becomes more and more prevalent. Many costs in the past would be associated with direct labor hours. So if you didn't know how exactly to charge a cost to a product, you say, well, how many people worked on it for how many hours? And let's just charge it by that ratio. Well, what's happened because of technology is that fewer and fewer people are working on product. And direct labor hours becomes less and less of a driver of cost as you have robotics and, and other things on the factory floor. So you need different ways to um, allocate. Fourth is focus on the customer. It's always been the focus. It's just more emphasized. 
customers expect functionality, quality, customization, and many things have intensified competition, including the internet, making it easier to, to go out there and compare and shop. Management organizations have shifted from rigid hierarchical organizations to more flexible matrix organizations. Um, there's been a shift in focus from only looking at financial measures as you um, judge your management to looking at financial and non-financial. And we'll talk about kind of sustainability measures as well as other measures that you start to look at now um, because financial measures are short-term. They're immediate. But you need to look at non-financial measures, which could be a judgment on how well you're going to do for the longer term. Social, political, and cultural considerations. A more diverse workforce. A more global business environment. When you're truly global, you don't have a US-centric view of, OK, we're US-based, but we're going to push a product out elsewhere. You have a view of we work globally, truly globally. So these are drivers. Um, and there are a series of techniques that are used. I, I won't list them all here because we'll talk about each one of them in more detail, so I won't, I won't just read them off. The balanced scorecard. Have you talked about this in any other class? We'll talk about this in the next chapter in greater detail. But it's a means of management judging performance across four planes, financial customer, business processes, and innovation and learning. So it's not just financial. And this is a management accounting role, the, the balanced scorecard. And the strategy map is an adjunct to it, which we'll mention. The value chain, you've all heard of the value chain. The value chain starts at R&D and ends in delivery and then every step along the way to get a product out to market. And if you can identify the steps in the value chain at a relatively detailed level, you can then use that knowledge to figure out which steps work, which steps don't work, where do you need to improve them, which ones might you outsource, which ones might, might you insource. Um, so you, you need to judge how well each step along the value chain is being managed towards your bottom line. So managing the value chain is an important part of what we're doing. Activity-based costing I mentioned. Um, it's a modern approach to um, allocating overhead. Um, and we'll talk more about what overhead means. I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but it, you know, one of the important issues of cost accounting is there, there are direct costs that you can truly associate with a product, and there are indirect costs, which you cannot truly associate. And how do you allocate properly across your mix of products so that each product has the appropriate cost associated with it? And that has important considerations for financial accounting, maybe towards pricing, and therefore the, the profitability of your company. Um, so there are important considerations of how well you do costing. And activity-based costing is a detail-based costing methodology that allows you to better allocate your costs. Now, there's, there's a cost to you of doing it at this detail level, so not every company does it because, you know, you have to make that decision as to whether it makes sense. And activity-based management is an adjunct to activity-based costing. Um, to make sure you manage at the activity level. Business analytics. This is an area that's truly just beginning to grow right now. Uh, business intelligence. Truly, it's, it's the it, it, it's one where you, data warehouses, um, things of that nature, where you, you're able to go in and query your databases. Walmart and Target. Walmart, what are they famous for? We, I think we did a presentation last time. So what, what, when you think of Walmart, what do you think of? 
low prices, managing their scale to, to force prices down. That's what Walmart's about. Target, what do you think about? Knowing about their customers. Did you see that recently? So they, they, they know so much about their customers. You know, that's, it, their name is Perfect Target, right? That, they, they, it, they, they, that's their strategy, to know their customers. They know so much about their customers that they don't want to use all their information because they think it's going to freak their customers out. Like if they know that a customer is pregnant, they could target all kinds of advertising towards that you're pregnant thing. But if a customer keeps getting advertisements that about being pregnant, they're going to know the target knows too much about them and they'll be turned off to target. So they throw in five advertisements, but one of them is for that baby carriage. And four of them aren't relevant. So they're trying to kind of fool you a little bit into saying, yeah, we know a little bit, but not too much. <laughs> so they're using business intelligence at a very high level. Another contemporary management technique is target costing. This is almost backwards, and we'll talk about this more also. This is backwards from what we think about for how you figure out how much you're going to charge for a product. You start off by understanding what can you get for your product in the marketplace. How much, how much could you possibly sell it for? You then figure out how much profit you want to get off of that sale. And based upon that, you then say, OK, here's how much it's going to cost. And then you have to work backwards from how much it's going to cost and say, OK, how are we going to put together systems and approaches so that we can deliver this product at that cost? Because if you can't deliver it at that cost, maybe you shouldn't be in that business. So you're working backwards from figuring out a price and going back to a cost. And this is very important when you have intensely competitive markets. You know? I think you probably would see this in the auto industry. Right, right. Which is why we're saying it's in a competitive market, right? So if the new product is probably no one else out there and you can set the price. So it's not used everywhere but it is a technique that's used in the right marketplaces. Life cycle costing, it means you monitor the cost of a product from the very beginning, R&D, all the way through delivery to the customer, not just the manufacturing costs. What are some industries where you think that might make some sense? Pharmaceuticals, where the R&D cost is so high that if you don't factor that in to the cost of each pill you sell, then you don't really know whether it was a profitable business or not. Sure. Any others? Potentially oil and gas, where you, you know, you're exploring for oil. You know, you, you missed on 20 wells, then you get the gusher. How are you going to factor in the cost of those 20 wells you missed on into the value of the ones you hit on? So anywhere there's a lot of R&D would be a, 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 a potential for lifestyle costing. Benchmarking. You identify your critical success factors, and then you look at the best practices of the firms that also have similar critical success factors, and then you institute the changes based upon that analysis. Business process improvement, the organization commits to change continuous improvement and compensation is based upon your continuous improvement. Quite often, it's kind of a step function in business process improvement when you implement a new technology. It forces the business process to change, but you can also change business processes all the time. 
total quality management um, is a management technique that says we're always going to exceed our customers' expectations. Lean accounting um, is based upon lean manufacturing, and you, it's a value stream approach, and we'll talk about this more, and what value streams are. The theory of constraints, I mentioned this earlier, is something where we may or may not have time to talk about in the class, using things like linear programming to understand where your bottlenecks are and manage those bottlenecks. And so you improve the cycle time, which improves the delivery of the customer, which improves your profitability. Can you overlap with operations? Absolutely. I, I, this is definitely overlapping with operations. Enterprise, whoops, enterprise sustainability. You know, and this is, this is 20 years ago, this would not have been thought about, trust me. Five years ago, it may have been thought about. But the, the idea that you need to be doing things that are socially, environmentally conscious because that will affect your financial ending. And so it, you need to have a long-term view of, uh, of your organization. And of course, risk management. Okay, let's, um, we're almost there. So there are only two strategies that we can have in a company, according to Michael Porter, who is a very smart guy, Harvard professor, started in the mid-70s. So when I was studying, we, we studied Michael Porter, but he remains smart. You are either a cost leader or a differentiator, one of those two. Now, he would say that a company has to be only one of those two. Um, I would say that you could differentiate products. You could have cost leader products and um, differentiated products. But your name usually is associated with one of those two things. But I think of the auto industry where, and I forget the relationships, um, Honda might be viewed as a cost leader in the auto industry. I forget who their high end is, whether it's Infinity or Lexus. It's Lexus. Lexus would be, it's Acura. So they, they would have Acura as their differentiated product. So to, to succeed, you want to view yourself either as a cost leader, where you'll outperform your competitors by producing at the lowest possible cost, as long as, but that doesn't mean that you can reduce your quality to the point where customers won't buy your product because that doesn't make any sense. So at the lowest possible cost, consistent with quality. Cost management is critical in this area. So what we learn in this, in this class is critical for those companies that view themselves as cost leaders, because you're trying to work every penny out of the process. Differentiators create value through innovation, features, customer service. It's also critical there. Um, but in a different way. I mean, everyone wants to manage their costs. Cost leaders have to manage their costs. So when you think about strategy, well, so comparing the two, cost leaders are looking to hit a cross-section, a broad cross-section of the market. Differentiators are focused on a segment of the market that's specific to them. Your competitive advantage will be the lowest cost versus unique service or product. You have a limited product line versus a wide product line. You have a wide product line for differentiators because each product's going to be targeted to a different segment of the market. You emphasize low costs and essential features and versus innovation and marketing effort, you know, marketing the market at low cost versus 
I don't think you market the premium price, you market the premium functionality, and people will pay the, the price for that. Um, I'm not going to go through this slide. This is in the text. You might want to take a look at it. So when you think about strategy, every company has a strategy. The first step in creating a strategy is a mission statement. Have you seen mission statements? Good. So here are some mission statements in the text. Ford, provide personal mobility for people around the world. IBM, to lead in the creation, development, and manufacturing of the industry's most advanced technologies and to translate these into value for our customers. As we look at each of these, let, let's step back to Ford. Do you think it's choosing to be a cost leader or a differentiator? Ford, provide personal mobility for people around the world. Cost, that's a message, you know, broad market. Can't get much broader than that. IBM, to lead in the creation, development, and manufacture industry's most advanced technologies and to translate these into value for our customers. Differentiation. To organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. Cost. When you think about it, Google is the best cost leader there is. How much do they charge for all their products? Nothing. Can't beat their cost. <laughs> Just gotta read their ads. Your world synchronized. I'm not sure where this takes you. Walt Disney to make people happy. <laughs> to improve, to preserve and improve human life. I'm not sure. Simply delight you every day. What do you think this one's saying? Look at this Sara Lee. Yeah, I guess. You can make a case for differentiation. I'm not sure. I think when you put the word every day in there, that means you want to be their staple. And I don't know that you're saying that your product is a diff you know, you want to be there every day. And that's probably you have to be at a certain cost point to do that. Okay, question for you, que questions for you all. Which strategy do you think would require a company to have a greater reliance upon cost management? A differentiated strategy or a cost leader strategy? <coughs> cost leader strategy, I think we said that. As a firm moves to the internet, how do you think that will affect its use of cost management systems? It will be a driver to cutting costs. So they're using the internet to get information and using that information to, to target. Okay, good. Any other thoughts? So they'll have real time data. They'll be able to use that, use the information they get quicker, and through that, through that speed of information, cut costs that way. Good. They can compare their price with the competitors. What does that do? So what does the internet do to a company? It forces them to be honest. It forces you to truly be a differentiator. Marketing as a differentiator is harder when information is more complete. So it, I, I think the internet tends to move people to be um, you know, cost-based rather than differentiation-based some degree. It's harder to differentiate 
when information is, is moving towards complete information. Okay, so now, third question. And talk among like two or three of you together for a couple of you know, a couple of minutes. Per, within the manufacturing service and the retail sec sectors, come up with one cost leader, one innovator for each. So you should have six answers in total. I appreciate I appreciate what you wrote on your survey to me. Thank you. Is that attendance sheet somewhere? Somebody have the attendance sheet? Can I come? Ah, thank you. Don't let the fact that like you don't know all the people get get you nervous. Because soon we'll be in. See, one of the great things about the teams is you'll get to know your teammates real fast. Okay. Home Depot is retail. Liz, so you'll you'll keep Janavi. How do you how do, not, not, Janavi? Sorry. So you'll keep her up to date and everything, right? So she, she had her baby a couple weeks early. I think she had a baby like a week. Yeah, so maybe as much as three weeks early. Yeah, yeah. I think she was due in two weeks. I think. So I think it's. Yeah, but every she, it sounds like everyone's okay. It was a little scary. She, but it sounds like everyone's okay. The other baby. Oh, congratulations. Two months. <laughs> oh, good. So, you know, working um, remotely might be a, an important process for the entire group. <laughs>
you guys ready? Okay, who are we, are we ready? Because I think we're talking, but maybe not about this. Maybe. You were still talking about that? Yeah, yeah, that's what I, mean. I I assumed that for a little while you were. Okay, so um, what's an example of a manufacturing firm that's a cost leader? All that work and nothing. Companies whose names we don't know. Oh, a generic pharmaceutical. Absolutely. Conagra. It's certainly a commodity product. By definition, mean, as commodity product as it gets. Sure, I would go with that. So they need to figure out how to produce grain or whatever else that they're producing as quickly as and efficiently as possible. How about a couple of um? How how about you know, we talked about it? What about in the auto industry? Yeah, Toyota would be you know they have a nice car, certainly meets customer quality needs, um, and they're looking for techniques to to work the cost out of the develop, delivery. What are some differentiators in manufacturing? They certainly have a lot of patents, and that would be a sign of innovation. I think that's fair. Um, no, De Dell would. Um, they, they 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 certainly pull together components. You know they they are, are you know they 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 would fall into manufacturing. So you would think of them as a an a differentiator? But does their high end truly differentiate from other high ends? I mean, if you're going in that industry, you got to go Apple, right? As an innovator? I, 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 I may be wrong. I, I'm, you, you, you know, I, I'll take your word as much. But I think of Dell. How are they different than HP, high-end or not? They're, they're, they, they struggle to find, I think it's a, a problem, and, it, and it's killing their margins. They struggle to find their differentiation. But I, I, you know, you can make a case. I don't know Dell that well, so maybe they do have a differentiated product. Definitely. They're definitely going after a niche market. All of you in 20 years. Absolutely, Tiffany, yeah. something like that. Good. How about um, let's go to service. FedEx, as in, let's go for cost first. But I think they're trying to differentiate their product. Right? Faster. UPS. So who in that in that space, who's the true cost leader? USPS, right? <laughs> Post office. <laughs> What's that? No, they haven't figured out they figured out how to low cost, they just haven't figured out how to co yeah, they, low price, they haven't figured out how to cover the cost. Yes. Yeah. Low cost service. Which is which? <laughs> Jet Blue. How about a company we talked about last semester in that space? Southwest. Because they actually can make, they're cost leader and they're making money off of it. I don't know whether JetBlue makes money, but they, I think JetBlue aims to be that cost leader. As a differentiator, yeah, 
that both is the differentiator. I think it may be in the service sector, you know, a New Jersey company, ADP. They provide a payroll service, very repeated, repeatable. They want to be able to charge small businesses relatively small amount of money for an important function, and so they want to make it a low cost um, product. How about high-end service providers? Oh, how about another low-end or low cost? H&R Block, sure, versus a personal accountant. How about in the um, financial services sector, a low cost? Scott Trade or E-Trade versus maybe Goldman Sachs. Retail, low cost, Walmart. High end, differentiator. Whole food. Um, Nordstrom's. My daughter pair, bought a pair of um, boots from Nordstrom's two and a half years ago, and they broke. I, I, she said, "Oh, I need a new pair of boots." I said, "Let's bring it back and see what they say." They took it back, no question. Two and a half years later, without a receipt, without a receipt, because they, you know. The differentiating. That, that's differentiation. You pay for it, but you know what? I'll go back to Nordstrom's. I don't think that's nice. I don't think they did it because they're nice. I think they did it because they just created a loyal customer. Companies don't do things because they're nice. Okay, ethics of management accounting. Last slide before breakout. Should management do everything possible to, to maximize efficiency and thus owner's wealth? That is the ethical question. Should you do everything you can to maximize efficiency and effectiveness? Some of the ways you could do that, but you have to ask the ethical question, is this right? You outsource your business function so to India, to China, to the Philippines, where the price points are different. Apple, do you use, um, I'm having a mind blank in the name of the company in China, that's Foxconn, thank you. Do you use Foxconn, which um, has some questionable, it's, it's still not clear, some questionable um, work conditions for its employees. Do you offshore the corporate entities? I don't know how many of you saw the recent 60 Minutes about this, where there are companies that are Switzerland based because of, for tax reasons, but they do all their business here. If you went to their office in Switzerland, it's a, it's a box, it's a post office box. And maybe an empty office with a secretary. So if you offshore your corporate entity for tax reasons or other reasons. Do you transfer income to tax advantage locations? We'll talk about this in the class. That's how some companies, GE as an example, pay zero US taxes. You transfer income and, and other things. A very important issue, particularly for companies that do business with the government, that is completely related to management accounting. Particularly, you know, and this is in the service industry more than any other, where you do cost plus billing. The, gov the government says, we'll pay you, if it costs you so much, we'll pay you that plus 10%. Well, do you, you know, how, what do you put into the costs? What do you include that the government's going to pay for? And you know, companies have been sued and they're gone out of business because of doing that in a non ethical fashion. Well, 
in, I'm thinking of it, I don't know that specific example, and maybe your team wants to look into that example. It's an interesting one. I'm thinking of it in government, where a consulting firm is doing consulting work to build a, a large system for the government, and you know, gov governments are notoriously inefficient and make you change your ways a lot. Therefore, to have a fixed cost project for $100 million to work for the government is a dangerous game. So you can agree to do a cost plus. The government would have access to specifics of your books. They're not going to see that, you know, IB, let's say IBM is doing the job. They're not going to see the entire financials for IBM. That's not of interest. And certainly the government also does this with um, the purchase of new aircraft, you know, whatever new aircraft or whatever. It's cost plus. But they can, you, you've delivered to them the cost basis for, that you've put into that specific product, whether it's a system or an airplane. Um, and the, que the ethical question is, what do you include in there? And what don't you include in there? And yeah, it's both ethical and if you're caught, then you have a problem. And the government probably misses out on more than 50%, but they're looking for it. They're trying to catch it. Another ethical question is, do you take corporate actions that may conflict with the greater good? Do you shut down businesses? Do you merge, um, et cetera? Things that are good for you in the short term, but the greater good of society may not be happy with that. Um, do you do business with politically questionable countries? Um, Venezuela and oil is a good example. And you know, something that's clearly in the news these days is corporate support of political action committees and charities. You know, corpor you know, corporations need to be careful. You're, they're allowed, you know, corporations are people. You got that? Uh, but they can deliver money to political action committees. Pretty sure that the major companies are going to be very careful about this because if they guess wrong, it's not going to be good for them. But smaller companies um, will probably contribute to the party they think is um, going to benefit them in the long term. Okay, so here's your first breakout, and I'll give you, um, I don't know if that clock is right. I know it's not right. <laughs>